the author writing the book of Matthew understands who their main character is definitely about. And one cannot investigate the dichotomy that the author of the book of Matthew writes with without investigating their genealogy. Which genealogy we will investigate at this moment and which genealogy we will find has some flaws within it that point into a direction unveiling the actual point of it. But before getting into that, I want to just bring up a question, and I believe this is a very rational question. I believe that this is very valid. How is it that Jesus is supposed to be the son of David biologically, biologically, yet the supposed son and not biological son of Joseph, Joseph being the actual biological connection supposedly to David. How does that work? Why is there a an inherent desire for the Jesus character to be linked to David, to Abraham, to these people, when the only link is the Joseph from within the genealogy, which Joseph is supposedly not the father of the Jesus character and is the only link to the David character. Why is it that that exists? How is, how is that possible that the Jesus character is supposed to be linked to David and to that, that bunch, yet having no biological connection to them at all, Yet through Joseph, supposedly, but Joseph not being the actual father of the child, Joseph having the actual biological link himself, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But as we go through this genealogy, we will actually see how and why it does make sense. of the book of Matthew, they are piecing their genealogy together through three by three specific categories. And they do begin with the wholesome background, sure, but they go into three main categories that are important, which are kings, governors, and governors slash priests. They present kings, these kings, they move on to become governors, and these governors move on to become governors slash priests. Matthew chapter 1, 2 through 6, Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, Jacob begat Judas, Judas begat Perez of Tamar, Perez begat Esram, Esram begat Aram, Aram Aminadab, Aminadab Nason, Nason Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, Obed begat Jesse, Jesse begat David. Here's our first cluster. In our first cluster, while beginning with the wholesome origin supposedly it ends with the king David and in our second cluster we we end with David in the first cluster we begin with David in the second cluster Matthew 1 6 through 12 David the king begat Solomon Solomon begat Rehoboam Rehoboam Abiah Abiah Asa Asa Jehoshaphat Jehoshaphat Joram Joram Mosias Mosias Jotham Jotham Ahaz Ahaz Ezekias Ezekias Manassas Manassas Ammon Ammon Josias Josiah begat Jeconiah and his brothers about that time of Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begat Salatiel. So now we have our transition from the kings to Salatiel, the role of governor now. As we pick up in the third cluster of Matthew 1, 12 to 16, Salatiel begat Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begat Abiud, Abiud, Eliakim, Eliakim, Azor. Azor Zadok, Zadok Akim, Akim Eliud, Eliud Eliezer, Eliezer Matan, Matan Jacob. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now Zerubbabel is, is noted as a governor in these texts, and this isn't governor as we in 2024 are familiar with. 
This is governor specific to the text and to the context. Haggai 2.21 says, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Zerubbabel, governor. Haggai 1.14, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. Zerubbabel, in context, is a Nagid. What is a Nagid? This is a commander, specifically civil, military, religious. This is a chief ruler, noble leader, or a chief governor of such a civil, military, religious group assembly that needs commanding. Now, while Nagid, the text actually lists the term governor as Pakal. What does that mean? Pakal meaning prefect. Prefect, governor, and we can we know what a prefect is. But in context, Nehemiah 5, 14 and 15, moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year, even unto the 2 and 30th year of Artaxerxes, that is 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor, but the former governors that have been before me were chargeable unto the people had taken of them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people. So the idea that I want to point out by this verse is that the governor here, as we can gain um, knowing what a prefect is, a governor in this context is set over, set over the people. Esther 3, 12. Then were the king's scribes called on the 13th day of the first month and... There was written according to all that Haman had commanded under the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were in every province and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writings thereof, and to every people after their language. When we're hearing governor in the context of what Zerubbabel is, he is a ruler over a people, and specifically he is a ruler over appointed by a king, Esther 9 and verse 3, and all the rulers of the provinces and the lieutenants and the deputies and officers of the king helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. Rulers of provinces are what go governors are. Deputies, lieutenants, same. First Chronicles 29 21 and 22, they sacrificed sacrifices unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings unto the Lord. And on the morrow after that day, even a thousand bullocks, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And did eat and drink before the Lord on that day with great gladness. They made Solomon the son of David king the second time and anointed him unto the Lord to be their chief governor and Zadok to be priest. We recognize Solomon as being king, but in correct context, Solomon is not king. Neither was David. These are chief governors because their deity is the actual king of them. Their deity is the actual king, and the one sitting on the earthly throne is simply a chief governor representing on earth the throne that is above, not religious throne. This is throne political. So when we get to this Matthew side of things and we're seeing how this genealogy is playing out and the roles therein, the, the moving from king to, to governor, and then we will see that in that third cluster of Zerubbabel, the names therein, they're not actually literally part of any genealogy within the Bible, and they represent something important. The switch there is important because the turn that the author takes, Matthew, writing the book of Matthew, the turn that they take, they actually allow us to understand via the turn that they take the intention for their text. Now, the names connecting to Zerubbabel in the genealogy of Matthew the names that come after Zerubbabel, they're not actually in Genesis to Malachi at all. You won't find them. And the connection there is a connection that does not exist with any of these names. 
especially with Zerubbabel, who throws a very particular wrench into the problem of genealogies, not just in the book of Matthew, but also in the Chronicles. So going to the book of Chronicles. First Chronicles 3, 17 to 19. And the sons of Jeconiah, Asir, Salatiel his son, Malkiram also, Padiah, Shenazar, Jechamiah, Hoshama, Nedabiah. And the sons of Padiah were Zorubabel and Shimei. And the sons of Zorubabel, Meshulam, Hananiah, Shalomith, their sister. Now we have a major problem here. We have a major problem here because in the Bible, and what I'm saying in the Bible, I'm saying Genesis to Malachi. From Genesis to Malachi, the father of Zerub Zerubbabel is not Selatiel. We just read this here. We're going to look at it again. The sons of Padiah were Zerubbabel. There is Selatiel in verse 17. He's right there. It's not a lie that he is the son. He is the son of Jeconiah, Jeconiah, the son of Josiah. But this Salatiel, his lineage is not given in the Bible. Instead, we have Zerubbabel, the son of Padiah, not the son of Salatiel. So to get to the bottom of this concerning Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel is the grandson of Jehoiachin. This is what's reported in the Bible. And also the son of Padiah. But he's also the son of Shalatiel. That's what's here acknowledged. He is the son of Padiah in First Chronicles, but he's also the son of Shalatiel. Now, let's look at Shalatiel. Shalatiel is the first son of Jehoiachin and the uncle of Zerubbabel, according to 1 Chronicles. Yet, in Haggai, he is Zerubbabel's father. Salatiel is the uncle of Zerubbabel, and yet the father of Zerubbabel, despite the actual father of Zerubbabel, being Padiah. This is a major error in this genealogy. This is a major error in this genealogy, and it is an error that allows us to understand that this genealogy should not really be taken that seriously, should not really be taken that literally. And so not taking this genealogy literally because we we really can't. It doesn't allow us to. We have to be able to understand that Matthew's genealogy is not a literal genealogy. It is as messed up as the genealogy from within the Chronicles. The names after Zerubbabel don't match. Don't match. Salatiel, his son is not Zerubbabel. And yet somehow he is, but he's not. The son of Zerubbabel, as mentioned in the genealogy of Matthew, is not the son of Zerubbabel, according to the genealogy in the Chronicles. So what the author of Matthew is doing here, they're, the names that they're using, these are invented names. That, that's, that's a given. But these are names that are invented for a specific reason and a very valid specific reason. Because when you go through each and every single one of these names, these names actually trace back to the priesthood or to priesthood and these names actually trace back to governors so the author of matthew by using these very specific names again specific names that are non-existent to the narrative from genesis to malachi they are invented names set in place yet invented names set in place for the purpose of allegory these names are supposed to represent allegorically the descent from governors slash priests. This is allegorical now. Understand the deeper meaning behind the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. 
Discover an allegory that speaks to personal and intellectual devotional growth. Meet the Dawn of Devotion, a sacrifice for devotional evolution. This book challenges traditional interpretations of Jesus' resurrection and crucifixion. Explore the allegorical journey reflecting personal and intellectual growth. Experience a narrative that transforms your understanding of devotion. Get your copy of The Dawn of Devotion, a sacrifice for devotional evolution today, and begin your resurrection. Names become very important after Zerubbabel. They become important because Zerubbabel does not really represent what we might assume, and we really have no clear identity for who Zerubbabel actually is, according to even the Chronicles, which have his biology mixed up. By the time we get to the genealogy in Matthew, the names after Zerubbabel, they are not literally connected to Zerubbabel, and we can know this because there is no record of them ever connecting from Genesis to Malachi. Can't be so consistent in the beginning and then all of a sudden of your genealogy, you lose connection for some reason. These names are not connected and the chronology in from Genesis to Malachi really messes that up. The author writing the book of Matthew invents names and puts names into place to fill out their chronology because they understand who they're writing about. Now, in their chronology, Zerubbabel is noted as the son of Shelatiel, which is not true. Shelatiel, his offspring is really not mentioned in the Chronicles at all or in the Bible at all, Genesis to Malachi. What we do have is the father of Zerubbabel being Padiah, and Padiah is a name that is associated to priesthood, and that's important, to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah 13, 13, and I made treasures over the treasuries, Shelemiah the priest, and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites, Padiah. The names here, after Zerubbabel, they are names that are completely disassociated from the text itself and are specifically known to the imagination of the author. Uh, when we're seeing, for example, Matan. Matan, 2 Kings eleven eighteen, and all the people of the land went into the house of Baal, break it down, his altars and his images, break they in pieces thoroughly, and slew Matan, the priest. When we're seeing Matan, we're supposed to understand that Matan signifies priest. This is not Matan, priest of Baal in the genealogy of Matthew. This is strictly allegorical, Matan meaning priest. Sadok is another name in that genealogy. In 1 Chronicles 15, 11, and David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priests and for the Levites. It's very plain. Zadok is connected to the priests and to the Levites. Ezekiel 40, 46, the chamber whose prospect is toward the north is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar. These are the sons of Zadok among the sons of Levi. When we're seeing Zadok in the genealogy of Matthew, we're supposed to know the descent from the sons of of Levi. That's why that name is there. Eliakim is another name that's there. Nehemiah 12, 41, and the priests, Eliakim. That's very plain there. The name is to signify priest. Akim is another name in Matthew's genealogy. Akim translates to mean Joachim, which also translates to mean Joachim. In Nehemiah 12, 8 through 12, we have, moreover, the Levites, Jeshua, and then jumping down to verse 10, where it says, And Jeshua begat Joachim. Now, the Levites, verse 8, the name Jeshua is given because he's a member of this clique. By the time you get to verse 10, Jeshua gives birth to Joachim, who is a member of this same Levitical clique. The name Akim or Joachim is mentioned in the genealogy of Matthew to figuratively allude to, again, the Levites. Azor is also a name mentioned in the genealogy of Matthew, and originally it's A-Z-O-R in the genealogy of Matthew, but it's A-Z-U-R in the Bible, Genesis to Malachi. Ezekiel 11, 1 and 2, Moreover, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward. And behold, at the door of the gate, five and twenty men, among whom I saw Jazaniah, the son of Azor, and Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, princes of the people. 
Then said he unto me, Son of man, these are the men that devise mischief and give wicked counsel in this city. The name Azor or Azor is here mentioned in Matthew's genealogy to connote to the governors of the people, to the princes or to the nobles of the people. Eliezer is another name that is mentioned in that genealogy of Matthew. Numbers 3.32, Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, shall be chief over the chief of the Levites and have the oversight of them that keep the charge of the sanctuary. First Chronicles 24.5, thus were they divided by lot, one sort with another, for the governors of the sanctuary and the governors of the house of God were of the sons of Eleazar and of the sons of Ithamar. The author of Matthew, they are using the names that they are using specifically after Zerubbabel. They know that there is no actual connection to any one of these names from within the Bible to a Zerubbabel. Yet they're using these names to figuratively allude to the connotation behind them. The connotation behind them, behind the names after Zerubbabel, is a connotation of governors combined priests, governors and priests combined. So when we're seeing the transition from kings, and then the transition from kings moves to governors, and then the transition from governors moves to governors and priests combined, and the highlighted priesthood here is the Levites, we're supposed to understand, according to the author scripting this genealogy, that their main character is supposed to descend from the kings of Israel and from the governor priests of Israel, from the throne of Israel and from the governor priests of Israel and the governor priests of Israel as connected to the Levites. That's why they have scripted it the way that they have. The genealogy of Matthew moves from kings to governors and from governors to governors slash priests, and then from these governors slash priests on to someone called Jacob. Now, this someone called Jacob never existed. This Jacob never existed. This Joseph never existed. This Matan never existed. That This Azor, this Zadok. These names are not connoting real people. These names after Zerubbabel, because after Zerubbabel, there is a disconnect even from Genesis to Malachi, and this is unknown. These names are invented. These invented names are given by the author of Matthew to signify and to place into order a lineage of their quote-unquote Joseph arising from out of governors slash priests. And governors slash priests primarily from the offspring of Levi. From the offspring of Levi, when we see now Jacob, after all of that, Jacob, which signifies a religious political landscape of a people called Israel, we're seeing that such gave birth to Joseph. And Joseph, it is very interesting that in the book of Genesis, Joseph is actually noted and fits perfectly with this genealogy in Matthew as a governor. Go into the book of Genesis. Genesis 45, 25, and 26. They went out of Egypt, came into the land of Canaan under Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is alive. He is governor of all the land of Egypt. Joseph is alive. He is governor. The reason why this Joseph is used in the genealogy is because governor is associated to the name. Now, what's also interesting is that while this name Joseph is used in the genealogy and this Joseph being a governor from the book of Genesis and this term governor fitting into the characters within the genealogy of Matthew. What's interesting is that this, this framework of Joseph, it's also captured in the book of Mark. Mark 14, 51 and 52. And there followed him a certain young man having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. This is a scene that the author of Mark has taken and plagiarized from the life of Joseph. That 
same governor. Genesis. Genesis 39, 11, and 12. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. This same language that is used here is the same language that the author of Mark uses for their young man that fled and got him out, leaving his garment behind. Now, the individual that is appointed governor over a territory of people, yet only less than them politically, is elevated by a universal king. Mark placing this scene into their narrative allows us to understand that their young man fulfills the role of a Joseph. Fulfills the role of a Joseph. The role of a Joseph being the role of someone that is falsely accused or sentenced to prison and then eventually resurrected or brought up out of prison to then eventually find place next to the universal king as only second to such a king being governor over that king's domain. The connection between the Joseph here in Matthew's genealogy and the young man in Mark's can't be ignored. They're referencing the same individual person. The same individual person. Their Joseph in reality, their Joseph in reality is someone, is someone whose lineage goes back to the throne of David and also to the governors and priests of that line goes back to the throne of David and also to the governors slash priests, the combined governors and priests, specifically of the Levites of that time. They are all Matthew, Mark, and Luke, writing about the same one individual, the same one individual whose descent is from the line of governor priests, of the Levites, and also connected to the throne of David. They know who they're writing about. Journey into a marriage of self-discovery with growth. Immerse yourself in eloquent verses that tenderly explore the bond between heart and mind, unveiling the art of self-love. Embark on a poetic odyssey between the heart's yearnings and the mind's reflections as they come together to highlight self-acceptance. Growth is a collection that gracefully unfolds the intricate chapters of one's own narrative. Each poem a testament to the intertwining journey of love, vulnerability, and cooperation. As you turn each page, you'll witness the blossoming of self-compassion, a gradual revelation as you navigate the labyrinth of emotions and thoughts. Discover the power and the beauty that arises from valuing your worth. Growth invites you to nurture your heart and mind, cultivating a garden of self-love. Observe and embrace the journey. Explore, evolve, and find solace in the verses that resonate with your very soul. The Joseph character from in the genealogy of Matthew, in reality, is someone that descends from a line of governor slash priests. They descend from a line of Levitical governor slash priests. They also descend from a line that is intimately connected to the throne of Israel. This quote unquote Joseph is the same one that is having dreams to flee with the supposed child that is his into Egypt. Which supposed child, as we saw from our previous episode, is a figurative Jeroboam. A figurative Jeroboam. In reality, the child of this Joseph character is actually a king of the Jews. And a king of the Jews, specifically linked to Jeroboam through the narrative that the author writing the book of Matthew is giving to their audience, giving to their congregation, two idols just as Jeroboam did. The author writing the book of Matthew understands where they're going, 
The author of the book of Matthew understands who their main character is. The author of the book of Matthew understands who their characters are. In reality, the Joseph character and the Jesus character, they're actually the same person. They're played by the same actor. And I understand how that may sound very strange, but we have to remember that whether it is Matthew or Mark or Luke or John or the Acts, this is a screenplay. This isn't real. This isn't literal. This is a screenplay. And it is a screenplay dedicated to the individual who is at the core of the thoughts of these writers. The Joseph character is the same character as the Jesus character. There is a play on a play going on here, and it has a lot to do with culture. It has a lot to do with culture, and it has a lot to do with the age. The age and the culture is one where rulers, especially Hellenistic, for which this age is centered in and for which the Herodians are, live on after death, becoming gods. Their life is extended through their cults and through the religions that are framed around their deified embodied figures. Their deified embodied figures are to live on when they're gone. That way, when they're gone, they're never gone. The characters, Joseph and Jesus, represent the same in the sense that the one that descended, the one that descended from the governor priest line and that also at the same time descended from the line of the throne of the Jews is the same one that is caring and careful for the Jesus character who is also himself. What we're actually reading about when we're looking at this genealogy of Matthew and when we're looking at the gospel records, we're looking at someone in a very, very brilliant way, writing themselves, writing themselves into religious history via a, a literary art that is absolutely brilliant. The main character here is the same one for whom the authors understand that this is for, and specifically for their age. When we're able to figure that out, and when we're able to see how they maneuver in the literary context behind their citations, well, then we're going to be able to understand the actual main character and the actual cradle that these narratives serve for that main character. That main character actually being a king of the Jews from the Herodian line, whose bloodline goes back to the throne of David and whose bloodline also goes back to the governor priests of the Levites. There was no other individual fitting this in that is acknowledged in history as such than Herod Agrippa I.